Too close for comfort, Terry Doe runs through his ratting tips when you start feeling hot rodent breath on the back of your neck. I didn't believe he had to aim higher. I thought we'd have to go lower, but yeah. you know, taking account now, you've got to go a lot higher. Homegrown ammo in a new mini-series. Paul Childerly looks at the cost savings of reloading a copper round. So we're going to try and make this bit nice and easy to understand, not just for the beginner or the, the novice or the one to start and to reload, but also for myself. More on air guns. Ian Hodge suggests which PCP to buy to deal with garden pests. We get an update from our fab FAB Field Sports Advice Bureau on what police forces have been doing to gun owners. David is on the Field Sports News stump and James has the latest YouTube hunting films in this week's Hunting YouTube. Welcome to Field Sports Britain. We're now going to deal with one of the hardest shots in air rifle shooting. And the funny thing is, too many people think it's one of the easiest. I'm talking about the ultra close range, the between three yards out to maybe 10 yards. A rat comes out, is almost looking down the barrel. Everybody who doesn't know about these things thinks that's the easiest shot in the world. It really isn't. First thing you wouldn't realize, if, unless you've done it, is that a four yard shot is pretty much the same aim point as a 45 yard shot. You've got to aim high. And there's the reason. It's the disparity between the sight line and the flight line. You're looking through this, the pellet's coming out of this. So this has got to come up to intercept that view. The only way to do it is to map out your rifle and scope trajectory. Set targets out every couple of yards from three onward and shoot one black spot in the middle of them until you've, you've worked out the aim points for every single range. And the other thing about ultra close range shooting is wear shooting glasses, proper ones. Clear ones, not Terminator, Disco, bright red or black or anything like that. <laughs> just ordinary, I know you'd be, you'd be, you'd be glitter and everything, you know, <laughs> but just wear ordinary, self-protecting sort of proper shooting glasses, not just you know stuff you'd use when you're drilling a hole in the wall. Proper shooting glasses, because there are so many angles at this, around here, this is the perfect sort of place with all the machinery and the bricks, and, and especially with RSJs, they can send pellets straight back to you. So wear glasses. But above all, learn your aim points at every range you use, from three yards out to the, the vast, you know, the fullest extent of your range, out to 55. Just learn them all on paper. On paper, not with spinners, not with tin cans, not with it, knockdowns, on paper. Paper is horribly brutal. It won't tell you any lies, it won't make you yeah. feel good. But once you've done it, write it all down, draw out your scope reticle, put your aim points on it, and what I do is I have it shrunk down and I laminate it and I stick it in the, either my pellet tin or on the one of these uh, lens caps, flip out lens caps, so you, you've always got it there. But until you know where to aim, you don't know it. What, what you're gonna do when that rat comes out at three yards and you haven't got a clue. The instinct is to aim low, but you don't. You aim quite a lot high, maybe by that much. Right, we're now gonna take one of these infamous ultra close range shot, in this case, four yards. We're gonna bring into play a ton of stuff to hit something the size of a rat's brain at four yards. For a start, we're gonna aim that high. Not many people will believe it, but I noticed while we were setting up, Dan's already adjusting the sticks, so he's getting into that. He's nice and relaxed, he's got his finger on the trigger. He's gonna knock, he's gonna aim above the black dot at the top of the target and squeeze off the shot. Over to you, Dan. No pressure, son. <laughs> no pressure. That, even with my dodgy eyes, went straight through the black. Did it not? Yep. It certainly Perfect. did. Just, just for um, the record, we're shooting into a, a bale, so that's why we don't have any, any glasses on. But normally, in a farmyard environment, there'd be safety glasses on. That 
is quite a technical shot, isn't it? You see what went into it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You saw what went into it? When you explained to you earlier, I didn't believe he had to aim higher. I thought we'd have to go lower, but, you know, taking into account, no, you've got to go a lot higher. You've got to go an awful lot higher. So imagine if you just aimed a bit lower. Yeah. You're already going that low. Yeah, you'd be even... Yeah, yeah. You'd miss it by six inches or something. It's absolutely mad. So do your homework, get the close-range stuff sorted out, and then move on in two-yard increments or metres, whatever whatever you're about and get all your ranges mapped out. You can't beat it. You, when a rifle and a scope and the pellets are this good, you, you're obliged to make the most of them. Yeah. And that's the way to do it. No, definitely. All right? Fantastic. Lovely. Thank you. Thanks, Terry and Dan. Now, in this week's Field Sports Extra, we have a couple of film stars, a curlew lover, and here's what happens when you stuff laurel leaves into Terry's mouth. <laughs> giving away a steel target this week. Here's Harvey Skinner from Tom's Targets to explain. So here at Tom's Targets today, we've got on offer the Pro Stand, which the stand is completely made out of hard ox, so there's no mild steel whatsoever. And we have the Fox Head Target, which is got the nice laser cut out groove, which fits all of our gongs are now being cut so they're interactive with this stand as we're stepping away from using the mild steel poles that we've used in the past. The good thing about the Pro Stand as well is it's completely flat pack. So once you've taken the target off like that, you simply pull up, the upright comes out, and then once again, it will all go completely flat pack and you can fit that in your rucksack and carry it out to the field with ease. The stand itself retails for $74.95 on our website and the head targets are £35 each. There's a link to it below. Easiest way to win it is to watch Field Sports Extra, which goes out the night before this show only to Field Sports members. Now with insurance, easiest way to watch Field Sports Extra is to join those members. We'll send you a goodie box. Our insurance covers you for legal issues over certificate renewal and all members with or without insurance get free access to our fab Field Sports Advice Bureau. Layla, the lawyer, is there to help you with Field Sports related issues and I had a chat with her about what kinds of inquiries she's been getting. Simply an allegation can put your certificate in jeopardy. There are new um, guidelines and they have levels of what they consider to be, like levels of severity of why they would revoke or refuse the certificates and domestic or alleged domestic situations are the, their top priority. So anything concerning a domestic, even if, it, if it's just alleged, you know, certificates are being revoked. Thanks, Leila. Link to the full version of that chat below. Next up, one of Jerry Anderson's less successful creations. It's David on the Field Sports Channel News Stump. This is Field Sports Channel News. A plan to reintroduce links to Scotland to control the deer population with big cats is doomed to failure. That's the view of a farmer who went to Switzerland as part of a fact-finding initiative organised by the group planning to free links in the Highlands. John McPherson joined CEOs, forestry representatives, deer stalkers and members of the sheep farming community to examine a similar scheme which has existed in Switzerland for 60 years. He believes a poor track record of consulting interested groups on the reintroduction of beavers and white-tailed eagles shows Scotland is incapable of making the Lynx programme work. He says the Swiss programme is based on consultation and cooperation and what's not being considered is what the big cats will actually eat. Red listed species that, are, that they're trying to preserve, the capercaillie and the the, the waders, etc. You know, they, they would not stop at, uh, at, at livestock, although their main prey is rodeo in, in Switzerland. But nobody, see, in this country, nobody seems to, uh, you know, bring to the, to the front of the argument the actual physical presence of an apex predator, you know, cons eating, killing, consuming, um, you know, live animals. We've not had that in this country for hundreds of years. And why is it okay now, you know, without, uh, and you know, we don't wait until, wait until we hear about cats and dogs being predated, you know, then the, the general public, the more general public would have a huge outcry about it. 
Is it all up for English deer? The Forestry Commission in England is joining its sister organisation, Forestry and Land Scotland, in calling for a massive cull. The government's Woodlands Agency and landowner claims it is campaigning to support other landowners managing deer. It believes there are more than two million in the UK. It wants female deer targeted more than males. The British Deer Society praises the government announcement. It's nice to see the Forestry Commission have latched on to Twice, because they always have been aware that the key to controlling deer is all about female numbers. You can have as many male deer as you like, but if, if there are too many females, they will increase. Um, so we've been fixated, I think, on male deer for far too long. Um, the other nice point to see, I mean, as the um, forest, Forestry Commission statements, is of course the fact they're saying now uh, that deer are not vermin, which they most certainly are not vermin. But for far too long, in a lot of courses, that's how they've been treated. So the British Deer Society want to see deer treated with a bit of respect, um, but practically, um, which means the numbers have got to be kept under control. Jeremy Clarkson proposes one solution for deer, feed them to children. In the latest series of Clarkson's Farm on Amazon Prime, he calls for venison to be used as part of a school dinner menu across the UK. It's a strategy the Deer Society proposed to DEFRA 18 months ago. Here's Charles Smith-Jones again. This is actually an idea that the British Deer Society had. We, we were saying, let's use venison. It's a very healthy um, form of red meat. It's probably the most, most ethically defensible red meat. Um, it's high in the good fats, low in the bad fats. Everything is going for it. Uh, so. Yes, uh, Jeremy Clarkson's done a wonderful job there. We need people like him to actually get the message out because he's got a huge following and people will listen. The more people who try venison, the more converts we're going to get because it is delicious and too many people feel that it's posh food. Um, it, it's an old fashioned look at it, but only, only, only earls and whatever's eat venison. No, everybody can eat venison. It's incredibly good and it needs to be on the supermarket shelves at the right price. Basque says the shooting community has a huge role to play in eradicating the UK of some of its 2,000 alien species. It has joined Invasive Species Week in the hope of educating people about the dangers posed by non-native animals, plants and even fish to the UK environment. Creatures such as the grey squirrel and mink, which now thrive in the UK after being introduced from elsewhere, pose a threat to biodiversity because they are such efficient killers. Ian Danby from Basque makes the case for shooting to mitigate their negative impact. And some of the impacts are quite large. So we've recently done a piece of work um, on the natural capital benefits of shooting. And we worked out that the existing level of control that we do as shooters of grey squirrel is avoiding the loss of around £32 million pounds worth of carbon every year from avoiding damage to new plantings of trees or trees which are trying to regenerate. So we've got a lot to be proud of, but we've got that role to play about vigilance, biosecurity and taking the correct action to remove invasive non-native species where we come across them. A protest lobby from six Commonwealth nations is hoping to embarrass the government via King Charles in an attempt to stop Britain banning trophy imports. The move comes after High Commissioners met DEFRA Minister Lord Richard Benyon to discuss UK government support for the Hunting Trophies Import Prohibition Bill. Botswana's High Commissioner Shimani Kalatswe told the King it would be unjust for the UK to pass the bill without considering the impact it would have on countries reliant on hunting in their economies. They're expected to raise the issue with King Charles if he attends a meeting of Commonwealth heads in October. Safari Club International's annual Lobby Week has been hailed a success. SCI members travelled to Capitol Hill in Washington to meet key US decision makers. SCI pushed the rights of hunters to enjoy freedom to hunt. It discussed policy and worldwide conservation initiatives in meetings with policymakers and politicians in Congress. Catches of wild salmon in Scotland have reached an all-time low. In 2023, Fisheries Management Scotland recorded 32,000 fish caught from Scotland's 173 salmon rivers. Most of those fish were released after capture. Catch and release is mandatory on 111 rivers. That's the lowest catch return for Scotland since records began in 1952. The Alliance of Salmon Fishery Boards blames a combination of weather, land management and water quality issues for the decline. 
the IUCN, which reclassified the salmon from least concern to endangered in Great Britain in 2023, goes further and says threats to salmon include climate change, dams and barriers, salmon farming, exploitation at sea, and invasive non-native species. A new book has been launched, which celebrates a year in the life of one of Britain's most enigmatic game birds, the grey partridge. Living with greys is the brainchild of author and sporting agent Tarquin Millington Drake. It tells the story of the life cycle of the British game bird. It explores how they are affected by farming practices and land management. If you buy the book from the link below, you'll also be helping the Game and Wildlife Conservation Trust. The author believes the grey partridge is an indicator species of the wider health of the British countryside. So it starts with insects and hares thrive, yellow hammers, linnets, corn buntings. All these birds will benefit from a habitat that, that a grey partridge is thriving in. Trap shooter Matt Coward Holly has made his way into the British team for the Paris Olympics. The former world champion won the last quota place in the GB team for France at the European Championships in Lenato. He won bronze at the Games in Tokyo in 2020, having only originally travelled to Japan as a reserve. The Essex shooter took up shooting when he had to abandon hopes of becoming a professional rugby player after twice breaking his back. And finally, a bequest of knives from famous deer stalker Life Bragg is to be auctioned to raise money for the Gamekeeper's Welfare Trust. The Danish hunter was wildlife manager of Till Hill Forestry and donated his collection to the Trust in his will. The GWT plans to sell the knives to raise funds for the families of gamekeepers it supports through difficult times. You can find out about the work of the Trust by clicking the link below. We want them to go to people who really are going to appreciate them and honour his memory. You are now up to date with Field Sports Channel News. Stalking the stories, fishing for facts. Thank you, David. And David, per likely requests, you like and subscribe under this film. Next, I go to one of Yorkshire's best known names, Water Priory, for a charity clay shoot that will go a long way to help the Countryside Alliance's lobbying campaign at this year's general election. Right. Right. Water Priory is one of the most exciting and sumptuous shoots in the country. Shooting here is usually an autumn and winter sport. On this summer's day, as they do once a year every year, its regular guns and their friends have come back to the place to give back. It's the annual Water Priory charity shoot. Uh, we have um, 60 teams of four next uh, tomorrow, plus the four loaders. And then today we've had 54 teams of eight people again. Yeah. Thanks, Alice. There's over, there's over 1,200 over the three days, nearly 1,400 people, I would say. We like to encourage people into the countryside. A lot of people that wouldn't see game shooting or couldn't afford game shooting will come to these. And all the helpers, they all give the time for charity, for nothing. And it is for nothing. And we have, what, what 70 helpers today. Again, if you had to pay them, and, and they'll be here tomorrow and Saturday, they give it all for nothing. All the young girls, the families, absolutely brilliant. I mean, we have 13,000 man days a year just on our own shoot. A lot of them are women and children, young kids at school. They couldn't do a proper job. They do our job. And the fate keeps people out of national health, stops us all getting too fat. You know, and it's, it's just there. It's a, it's a good tool. Socialising tool, especially for the children. When I say charity shoot, this is on a scale that most shoots cannot achieve. It's two days of simulated game and on the third day they hold a ball for their visiting guns. In 2023 they raised £165,000 for Parkinson's disease charities. Oh, oh, I've else. Missed Have a go. I missed it. This year they are hoping to beat that and the nominated charity is the Countryside Alliance. Over the year we've raised over a million quid now for the charities at one way and another. Uh, we try to pick a different charity, local, then a fat. But it's the first time we've done something to fight the fight for field sports. Need supporting. 
it definitely needs supporting. We've got to fight the fight with a change of government most likely coming. It's fabulously generous of them. Um, but they're a great team and they understand that you know, we're facing a really challenging time for game shooting um, over the next few years. A change of government, political uncertainty. Um, we know that, that um, there's been a, a variety of noises out of the Labour Party about, about their approach to game shooting. Some of it's been positive, but then some of it's been less so. Um, and the, and the, the, the most important thing is that game shooting and, and the countryside as a whole has that strong voice in Westminster as well as all the other parliaments across the country and uh, that's what we hope we provide and, and Water Priory are being hugely helpful in supporting us. A shoot like this attracts the shooting celebs. It is a huge day and the guns need careful looking after. Step forward, Waters, head loader. Okay. Open again. I think whether it's a clear day or whether it's a game day, my sort of modus operandi, if you like, is wanting to get people to relax. It's easy for us, after a thousand days loading, to just be blasé about being stood with people. I think you've got to appreciate here we get all sorts of people. It might be a plumber that served for 10 years to come for his one day, and they can be nervous as a kitten. Our job, while keeping them safe and sporting, is I find if we can get them to relax, however that's done, you know, without giving them a massage, if you like, if you can get them to relax and just point them in the right direction, and if they, if they relax, they will probably then shoot with a bit of stand. And it, with a little bit of experience, just behind and thinking, well, that was never enough or that was way too much, we can usually, although we're not here as guard, you know, coaches, we can usually get somebody into a ballpark even if we have to let them come downstairs a little bit, but once we've got them on to summit, whether it's clear or game, taking it sporting with game, we can then get them to raise their ambition a bit. And once somebody started to find a few, then they get the confidence and then they relax and then it compounds that way, rather than getting tense and it compounding downwards. Will people like Dave have a job if Labour get into power? That's a question for Tim. I'm confident that we've influenced the direction of the Labour Party over the last few years and, and that means they have pulled back of some of the more extreme stuff we saw that the, 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 Corbyn, um, the, the Corbyn Labour Party talking about but there are still challenges ahead and we have to make sure we have to watch every, every inch of this journey and make sure that shooting and the countryside as a whole are protected. The, the Labour Party have made real efforts to reach out to the rural community. There's no doubt about that at all. How much, how much we can believe them, how much we trust them, how much is just words and how much will be delivery we will see. Um, interestingly, um, Keir Starmer does come from a long line of gamekeepers, um, I, I understand. His, his great-grandfather was a gamekeeper, as were, as were many descendants before that. Um, I, I think they've, they've got a long way to go, not least, and let's remember this, that it is a Labour government in Wales which has very publicly attacked shooting, not just around you know, sort of minor issues around regulation, because it, it, it has said, and it's very, said very clearly, it has a, a moral objection to shooting for sport. That is a real challenge. Uh, and one of the places Labour is still finding it difficult is to justify the behaviour of the, of, of the Labour government in Wales. And we know, we know that as, as hard as uh, many people in the Labour Party are working to, to detoxify it after a, a difficult period, there are still plenty of Labour MPs on the back benches who would attack um, shooting given half a chance for reasons that have got nothing to do with the activity, the more about the perception of who does it. The seriousness of the political situation does not dampen spirits at Water Priory. Westminster seems a long way away from the hanging woods of Yorkshire. And any excuse to have a party or to do something, we do a lot for all field sports. Tomorrow the hounds will turn up, they'll give them a little buzz around, anybody can meet the foxhounds or trail hounds or whatever you want to call them nowadays. But it's something for field sports, happens at water all the time. For more from the truly fabulous Water Priory, visit waterpriory.com or find the shoot on Guns on Pegs. Thanks to all who took part and organised that. Now, we have a new series with Paul and his reloading friend who, for security reasons, will be heard but will not be seen. My reloading experience has been practical. I basically started reloading back probably 20, probably 20 plus years ago, and it was 20 to 250, burning through a lot of rains every morning, going out, hitting the vermin hard, 
and we got a formula that worked and we were making 20 to 50 rounds that suited two rifles and it was, it was easy. So we're gonna try and make this bit nice and easy to understand, not just for the beginner or the, the novice or the one to start and to reload, but also for myself, because you know we're all learning all the time. Um, but luckily a friend is, you know, his, his business is loading. We do stuff together. We, we've done a lot of loading on the, the copper, especially the 243, got some fantastic results on that which you know a lot of people were talking the 243 was going to be the the end of the 243 the copper but i think for me at the moment I'm, I'm shooting that all the time it's you know great results great grouping knockdown power is brilliant so yeah so what do you need then so to to start loading you need you need some brass you can use your fire brass that you've been using from factory yeah, that's ammunition. important because so uh, so fire brass is basically stuff you've shot before. Does it no matter what make it is? Or? Ideally, you don't want to be mixing brands because you're right. going to have different case volumes. Different shape, different yeah, slightly different it, pressure. This or... is it, and, and it's going to cause different pressures. So that gives you a different, obviously. This is it. So develop a load using same brass, same brass, whether it's fired or, 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 or new. Yeah. yeah, or new brass, yeah. Suitable powder, yeah. there's loads of information yeah. online. Obviously expensive powders, they're different most brands. of the powders now come in kilo tubs. Yeah. Um, Vitavori do offer half kilo tubs, yeah. but I don't think that that comes in anymore. No, um, no. It's all in kilo tubs. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it is an expense, and that's why you're better off doing your research to find out what powder, powder. you need. And how much is a kilo of powder then? It's about £115 a kilo. And how many bullets out of that? It, it, yeah, it varies what yeah. you're. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it varies. Um, Reloading is cost effective for the average. It's cost sort of effective, yeah. It's it's cheaper than factory, especially yeah. when it comes to copper. Yeah. Um, it, yeah. Is, it is still cheaper. It's not as cheap as it used to be years ago when yeah. we started doing it, but yeah. it is still cheaper. Um, yeah. And that's the appeal, I'd imagine. Yeah, that, that's it. And availability. Yeah. That's the other thing because yeah, what we're course. finding is you could you could get the bullets and you could get the components, but, yeah. uh, but people couldn't buy the factory ammunition. Yeah. So that's why a lot of people have gone, gone down that route. Gone down that route. They've gone down that route. Now they find and probably their accuracy has improved this because is it, it is yeah. more of an accurate bullet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This um, is it, and it is a rabbit hole. Yeah. Reloading. You yeah, do. Yeah. It's um. You do get down there. Very few people just load, um, and don't tinker. So then, and then you've got the um, primers. Primers, yeah, they're they're um, thin on the ground at the moment. We, we've gone really? from the shooters were very picky on what primers they would use. Now it's a case of what primer can I get, yeah, yeah. and I'll use anything. Yeah. Um, so and is that again because of the war? Oh yeah, yeah. yeah a, a lot of the manufacturers have stopped selling primers, yeah. and they're putting it in factory ammunition, yeah. um, so they can use everything that they can yeah. produce. Cool. Um, so yeah, you, you will get a good result with any primer. Yeah. If you say 16 pence for a primer, uh, let's see. And then one tw one pound twenty for a bullet, um, and then roughly there's fifteen thousand grains roughly in a kilo of powder. Um, if we say, oh, no, oh, this is very very rough. So there's approximately three hundred and seventy-five two four three rounds in a kilo of of powder. So. 30 pence for the powder yeah and then um and then a case if you're using once fired cases you haven't got that expense yeah so it's about 166 and around. your time uh, and your time yeah but that's an interest that's the thing it's a, it's a hobby as yes. much as it is a yeah as very, a practical very true. Side of it. yeah very and true a, so and then we'll two for three would cost so it's 33 pounds a box for home loads uh against uh approximately 55 pound a box for factory in copper it, that's in copper yeah yeah that's in copper Thank you, Paul, and the other person. Next up, with garden birds under pressure from scallywag, corvids and squirrels, Ian Hodge sells a lot of PCPs at this time of year. He compares two of his favourites. A man came into Ian Hodge Field Sports who had a problem with a single rabbit and he was prepared to spend any money to solve it. Yes, we had a chap come, come in uh, a few years ago and he said, uh, I need a, an air gun, best one you've got. And so I thought, well, I, I thought, well, I don't know if you want the best one we've got. I could sense that he wasn't a full-time shooter as such. So he had one rabbit coming into his holiday home in Rock and he needed to sort it out. I mean, I did, he did buy more than what he needed to, but I, I was quite happy with that. But apparently, uh, once I told him that one rabbit generally leads to a lot more rabbits very quickly, he needed to sort it out. And he just, uh, just spent a fortune on his gardener and he needed... Uh, 
needed it sorted. So we came in and, and we fitted them up with a, a nice package. We do tend to ask what they, they what they're shooting and and their budget within region. I don't like to be rude, but you just there's no point showing somebody a two thousand pound egg and when they haven't got a uh, no intention of spending anything near that. So we tend to go down to this sort sort of level, cheaper but by no means poor quality. These are lovely, reliable guns. Um, excellent. We've got the Stoger ball pump here, which I've got one myself. When I go around on the farm seeing the cattle in the summer, it's next to me. It's nice and easy to handle. Put it out the gator window uh, and I've shot literally hundreds and hundreds of rabbits with it. It's so, um, got a side lever, so it's nice and quick to, to, to use. And again, so quiet. Um, it doesn't spook any other rabbit. I've shot rabbit next to rabbit next to rabbit, and they and they don't they don't move. And of course, when you're out seeing the cattle with the gator, uh, they're used to the used to the gator going around at certain times of the day. So the the rabbits um, really don't know what hit them. This is the ATA Airborne. It is a monster of a gun. Uh, it looks heavy, and it is pretty heavy, but you certainly you don't get it moving. You can fit a stud and put a bipod on there if you want to, which will make things a lot easier, or you can rest it on a bag. It certainly doesn't move. Again, side lever, multi-shot. This one's packaged up. Um, it comes with the, the silencer, but we've put a, uh, a Wolf telescopic sight on there. Um, and we're looking all in 475, which is fantastic value for money. And being a new gun, both of these guns include VAT, so if you are a full-time pest controller, farmer, and you're back registered, you can claim VAT back on new guns. So these make these, you know, so cheap. We're almost giving them away. The main thing is don't leave it a long period of time without firing it. Even if you just fire two or three shots off a week and you haven't got to put a pellet in there, unlike a string gun, you can't damage PCPs by dry firing. So we always recommend if you're not using the gun, just fire off a couple of shots safely because you must always obviously think that there's a pellet in the gun and that will just keep things um, going and not, going along nicely. So what about that man with his rabbit? We never seen him again but the fact that he never came back means he must be happy and he got his rabbit. <laughs> For more go to ianhodgefieldsports.co.uk Now from air guns to the wider world of hunting and shooting on YouTube brought to you by James Marchington it's Hunting YouTube. This is Hunting YouTube which aims to show the latest and best hunting and shooting videos that YouTube has to offer. Here's what I picked for you this week. First up, David from Predator Protection UK takes a newcomer out for her very first time shooting any sort of gun, and she does seem to enjoy it. Here's a heart-stopping moment. A group of hunters face a buffalo charge at short range, and only just manage to stop the animal in time. Watching the chap desperately trying to work his bolt action really brings home the advantage of a double barrel in this sort of situation. Next, the wooded beardsman sets off for a three-day survival challenge in the woods, carrying only what he can stuff into a five gallon bucket. He does it in style and eats pretty well too. Here's one you definitely shouldn't try at home. Target Focused Life tests what happens if you block a shotgun barrel with mud and pull the trigger, and the results aren't pretty. Build Sports member Avian Sandercock sends us this one. He and some friends have taken on a small DIY shoot in Cornwall, and they're trying to run it on a shoestring. Their new channel, A Year in the Woods, chronicles their efforts. James Crowther, the cigar smoking hunter, has a successful stalk after Robux with John Robson in lovely Yorkshire scenery and with plenty of deer on the ground. Stuart from Vermin Control Scotland has been busy on rats lately. In this one, he's shooting them at night at a waste management site, using its sub-12 foot-pound Air Max crate and dark and optic scope. And finally, Peter Jones from County Deer Stalking takes a stroll around the stalking show, picking out his top seven hunting rifles for 2024, with guns from 1,000 to 10,000 pounds. Well, that's it for this week. I've put all these films into a playlist for you. Click on the eye symbol top right or check this film's description. If you have a YouTube film you'd like us to pop into the weekly top eight, email me the link, jamesm at fieldsportschannel.tv. And that's it for this week. If you haven't done so already, please whiz over to our website, fieldsportschannel.tv. You can click to like us on Facebook and on Instagram. You can follow us on Twitter, subscribe to us on YouTube, pop your email address into our register page, and we'll contact you about this show, Field Sports Britain. It's at 7 p.m. UK time every Wednesday, and this has been Field Sports Britain. Good hunting, good shooting, good fishing, and goodbye. Goodbye.